Hello and welcome back everyone. My name is Sky Denton and I'm really excited that you're here on today's show. This is the place of positivity and empowerment for people all over the planet with ankylosing spondylitis and other diseases as well. I am here to tell you that it is possible to feel good again. I have done it, Peter has done it, other people have done it, there are people all over the planet going into remission. And so it is an honor to be here and to tell you that I absolutely know that it is possible for you to feel good again. It's important also to recognize that Peter and I's understanding of health is very comprehensive. It brings into account mind. It brings into account emotions. It brings into account epigenetics. It brings into account neuroplasticity. It brings into account diet, but just as important or even more important, the mental state that is the impetus for someone going on a diet. And all of these have given us a profoundly cool and unique and deep and very true understanding of wellness and what it means to be well and especially when it comes to dealing with chronic pain, autoimmune disease, you know, sore joints, ankylosing spondylitis. And it allows us to give you a very unique insight into what we believe is possible for you. And that being said, it's also important that I be very honest and tell you that we're not doctors. This is a disclaimer here. We, we are not doctors. We did not study medicine. We are not medical practitioners. So I'm not curing disease. I'm not, I'm not treating any disease. I'm teaching you how to become well. So is Peter. And when we become well, our body heals. The, the pain can leave. The inflammation can leave. The, the brain reprograms and we become a happier, more joyous person that is in a lot less pain. So just Keep that in consideration because the, the outlooks we have, the, the knowledge we have is, comes from all over the planet, from ancient philosophies to modern day epigenetics and, and brain mapping. And so it's very fun and it's really, it's an honor to be here to share this information with you. Some of the topics that we also talk about, Peter shares a habit that heals today. It's lesson number four. And it's a really, really important one. I'm excited for you to hear that. In my life, I got online after I was diagnosed and I was gonna look up everything I could to learn about AS. And I realized, and Peter pointed out in today's show, that when that's what I was looking up every day, it was stressful. It was a stressful place to be looking. It was stressful to be reading all these cases of people that just became absolutely crippled and victimized from ankylosing spondylitis. For me, I didn't start developing the virtues of wellness that allowed my body to come back into balance until I started becoming grateful for things that were good in my life. And Peter pointed out something that we talked about on the show, but I'll, I'll preface it now, is that even when we have intense flare-ups, if you are laying in bed right now and you cannot get up and you are sad and angry, I want you to also know that a lot of your body, most of your body, even higher than 90% of your body is working perfectly. You can taste, you can see, you can hear, you can feel, you can think, you can talk. There are things that you can do, and we can be so focused on the negativity, so focused on the pain, and that is a stressful place to be. So I just want you to be aware that you can also work towards, again, it takes time. These things can take a little bit of time, but we can become grateful for the good things, and then more good things show up. And as the brain adapts to that, as the body's physiology and biochemistry changes to match the the acknowledgement of being grateful for those things, the body continues to get better and better and better. I'm honored to tell you that it is possible to feel good again and listen to this episode and I'll talk to you again in a few minutes. Hello, Peter Winslow, and welcome back. 
Hello, Skyler. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you too. You were telling me before the call that you've been exercising a lot lately. How's that feeling? Oh, it feels so good to be back in the gym. <laughs> you know, the gyms have been closed for a number of months now, and they just opened up this past week. And I've been exercising at home, doing what I can do, you know, uh, by myself. But there's nothing like being in there with all the weights and the machines, and all the equipment, the cardio stuff. I just love moving my body. It feels mm -hmm. so good. Yeah. That was one of the really, one of the highlights of my time with you was, was the time learning to move my body and to use the weights and and going into the gym and listening to music and feeling excited and watching myself get stronger being able to lift heavy weights and i uh i live in a small town we don't have those big fancy gyms like you do but i do miss them <laughs> <laughs> yeah it felt good didn't it and if you do it properly it rewires the brain out of chronic pain so a lot of teachers out there are talking about how pain is in the brain only. You think it's in the back or the hips or the body somehow, somewhere. That's the feedback loop of the nervous system registering. But it's the pain is in the brain that we want to pay attention to. Because when we rewire the brain, we can wire ourselves literally out of chronic pain. And that's what I've done. Mm -hmm. That's what I do with my clients. That's what you did. So you learned how to do it properly. Again training properly is important to understand and to perform. Absolutely. Absolutely. The topic I'm really excited to talk to you about today has to do with anger. And I am thinking now about my time coaching with you. And in the very beginning, I remember being on the phone with you and I was literally sitting outside of this fitness center that I was just doing drop in, you know, daily passes to. And I had never considered myself an angry person. And I remember be literally being on the phone with you in this little Subaru Outback. And I was like, Peter, I'm going to go into the gym and I'm going to actually allow myself to feel anger today. And I remember getting on the elliptical, whatever music I had, and I let anger kind of like move through my body. And it was not natural for me because it, expressing anger in any physical way was not something I was used to doing at all. And I recognize now that I definitely had anger issues and they were almost all directed inward at myself. I was angry at myself and never lashed out at other people. I never like yelled or never abused anyone. I, I just put it all inward and it was very self abusive. What are your thoughts on anger, ankylosing spondylitis, your history, what you see in clients and your ideas on anger. Well, how much time have you got? You got a few <laughs> hours to discuss this? Oh, we've got, we could do 10 podcasts on anger for sure. We certainly could. And yeah, anger is, everybody I've ever talked to who's got ankylosing spondylitis has anger issues, mostly directed internally at themselves. And they're not aware of it. Like you said, you didn't think of yourself as an angry person. Mm -hmm. For me, my anger, I used to express outwardly. So, I would get in a lot of fights and arguments with people. And I used to hang out in dangerous places like roadhouse bars with bikers and cowboys who carry guns and start fist fights because I was just angry all the time. And then I realized I took it from my environment because my dad was angry. He was always angry. I mean, always, always. He was coming from a place of anger. Uh, sure, there's notable exceptions from time to time, like on Christmas Day, he wouldn't be too angry, but he always had that boiling in the background and he used to act out on it. He was a military combat commander. So, I mean, it was very useful in that operational theater. But I picked up those cues and unlike you, you learned polity. You learned that to be polite was important. And I learned that too. I learned etiquette and, and politeness, uh, but I expressed my anger externally and you did not do that because you thought it wasn't polite to do so. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Absolutely. I was afraid of hurting people's feelings. I was, I was very afraid to express anger because I didn't think it was the right thing to do. So you learned how to internalize it. Yeah. I think that's even less healthy than getting it out. That's why I use uh, working out in the gym. When I finally found in, at the age of about 20 years old that working out could burn off my anger, I directed it in that way intentionally for many years. 
and I'd get upset or, you know, peeved at something that was happening in my life, I'd hit the gym and just bust it out, man. Just really get it out of my system. And at the end of that workout, I'd be whipped, thoroughly whipped when the smoke cleared, better for the effort. Mm -hmm. But for people who internalize it, where does it go? When you swallow your anger and you just hold it back and hold it down and ignore it, does it take residence in your tissues? There's a lot of people who believe it does. And what happens to that energy when you just don't let it out? Can it make you sick? It's called stress. And obviously the medical studies all show now that stress is implicated in stress-related illness, which is about 90 to 95% of doctor visits in America are due to stress and stress-related illnesses. Mm -hmm. So yeah, everybody that I've known with AS has anger issues of one kind or another. It's almost simultaneously absorbed the anger, and the chronic pain. Now, if you go to philosophies, for instance, if you go to Buddhism, and by the way, Buddhism is not a religion. It's a philosophy. There's no God of Buddhas, Buddhism. The Buddha was just a man who achieved enlightenment. And he said, anger is hell. If you're living in anger, you're living in hell. And after being through that period of my life, I realized how that was really apropos to my experience. Now I don't have any anger anymore. I can't even get angry, really. Cut me off in traffic, I'll just slow down and back up and say, <laughs> that guy must be in a hurry. Let him go. <laughs> so I discovered that when you let go of anger, you don't get angry. You can't really be angry anymore because you've let it go. So you could get frustrated or you could get perturbed over one thing or another, but if you've done your work and balanced your emotional profiles, None of these things ever hijack you anymore. There's no amygdala hijack in the uh, brain going on if you've done your work and cleared your anger. And that's what people with anger need to do to let go of chronic pain. So that's one thing that I've discovered is why AS happens to these people. They've got the genetics perhaps for it, but it doesn't express itself until they get emotionally stressed internally and that stress reaches a critical mass to where they can't ignore it anymore. And it takes its toll on the body, in the brain. And so chronic pain is oftentimes the result. So that makes them even more cranky and feeling worse about themselves from there. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that they are sick and ill and not feeling good. And the term they'll use is sick and tired. Yeah, they're sick and tired, all right. Physically, mentally, and emotionally. So yeah, anger is the big indicator for people with chronic illness in one form or another, in my experience. Yeah, okay. And you bring up a really interesting point. And so you and I both had the same disease, ankylosing spondylitis, and we both expressed anger very differently. I mean, I arguably didn't express anger. I just swallowed it. You chose to go and like, Get it out. Getting brawls, <laughs> yeah, probably literally. <laughs> I was a brawler, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, that was my MO. Yeah. yeah. And that's interesting because, so for the listeners out there, I've spoken with a lot of people with AS, and they don't know that they're angry. I didn't know I was angry until I came to you. And then with some, you know, with some time learning some things, I realized that I actually was. But it can look it can be very quiet. Like mine was a very quiet anger, but it was just bubbling like right beneath the surface. And what it looked like for me was a lot of self-judgment, a tremendous amount of self-judgment. And I was angry that I wasn't more in life. I was angry that I hadn't done more. I was angry that I wasn't perfect. I was angry that I wasn't getting up earlier. I was angry that I wasn't more productive every day. Would you agree that that is, am I correct? And that like that intense self-judgment, that's what anger can look like for some people? Certainly can. You're a living example of that very thing. So that anger creates resentment. And I, as I teach in my group classes, there is a, an antidote for that. And the antidote for anger is to recognize what anger is in the first place. So anger is always caused by one emotion and one emotion only, one feeling and one feeling only, one thought and one thought only. Every form of anger that you can 
assess or identify is due to this emotion and thought. It's not fair. Hmm. That's what causes anger. It's not fair to me. It's not fair to my loved ones. It's not fair to people in general. It's just not fair. That creates resentment and anger. And so that's what you were feeling deeper below the levels of anger that you weren't even aware of to that degree. Yeah. Below that was resentment of yourself, self-abnegation, self-destruction. I've not done enough. I'm not good enough. I, I'm not accomplished enough. Mm -hmm. It's not. Why did this happen to me? Why did I get this pain and suffering? What's up with that? And the pain and suffering actually came to you to wake you up from that deep sleep you've been in and that denial that's taken place in your life up to this point. Because with the chronic pain and illness, you can't ignore it. You absolutely have got to live with it. You've got to do something about it. You've got to do your best to find a solution. You cannot ignore the pain of AS. It's too darn painful. And it's created by that feeling underneath of anger, which comes from the sentiment of it's not fair, which comes from the resentment that you're feeling for yourself at deeper levels. It's pretty obvious if people, you know, people can argue and push back and say, well, it's not the case with me, it's genetic or, you know, whatever their belief is. And that's fine. It's all right. But if you feel anger or resentment or resistance of any kind, it blocks you from happiness. Mm -hmm. In fact, resentment blocks us from wealth. In my wealth counseling and coaching practices, I talk to people about that. And I know as soon as they feel resentment about something or another, they take a big hit financially. I don't know why that is, but it certainly is the case. I've witnessed it time and again in my mm -hmm. wealth coaching practices. So if you're resisting or resentful, it blocks flow of currency. Air is currency. Money is currency. Water is flow of currency. Air is I mentioned air, you know, love flows, electricity flows, these currencies. When you block the currencies in your life, they back up within you and cause issues. And that's what resentment and resistance do. And that's what everybody with anger and AES is doing. They're resisting and resenting and feeling deeper uh, animosities on those levels that they're not even aware of. This is called the subconscious mind. Subconscious means you don't know it. People think, well, I know my subconscious mind. Well, no, it's below your consciousness. Subconscious means below your awareness. You're not aware of it. And that's what's going on for these people that creates the uh, stress that leads to the negative immune response, which causes inflammation, which leads to pain in the tissues. And then they just try and put a Band-Aid over the pain with drugs and, and uh, medical procedures without eradicating the cause, which is that, re, that resistance on the uh, internal levels, which leads to the surface level of anger. So for people like you, you just swallow it and try and tamp it back down and don't express it. And then you, you go on your way with your persona intact, saying, I'm okay. You know, when you're meeting people, you're acting like nothing's wrong here, nothing to see here, move along, it's all good, I'm fine. And then you even get to the point where you deny yourself and don't allow people to know what's really going on with you because you're embarrassed of it. And that leads to more, this isn't fair, I, it isn't working for me, which leads to that anger again and again. Yes, I agree. And there's a, there's a really, really strong feedback loop that happens with people with AS. I can see it clearly in myself and in others as well. And it's this, the energy of resentment, I can see how that was alive in my body before I even got symptoms. And then when I did started getting symptoms and I had a lot of physical pain and I couldn't do the things I wanted to do anymore, I couldn't live a normal life, then I became even more resentful. I remember looking at my friends who they would go out and drink and party and I would, I, I wouldn't. And I just, I became resentful of everyone everywhere because I was in pain and they weren't. And I had this disease that was really hard to live with and they didn't. And I remember a classic example of where a lot of my friends went to a music festival. You've heard of Burning Man, like when the biggest oh, sure. gatherings of people ever. And uh, I couldn't go. And I was so pissed. I was so resentful. 
that all my friends got to go and dance and listen to music and camp and celebrate. And I could barely get out of bed. And I can see where that aliveness of resent just continued my downward spiral of health. And the underlying sentiment to that was, it's not fair. Exactly. Totally. That's what causes anger. Yeah. And I had that before AS. And then that's such an interesting mental component to understand. Because then someone is labeled with, you know, as someone with ankylosing spondylitis, and they become unique in that. And it's not a fun thing to be diagnosed with. And so we take on like, this is not fair. Like, I'm pissed. This is not fair. And I remember just being so angry at everyone because they could live a normal life. And again, it was all coming back to this isn't fair. So the antidote for that is to recognize that, yeah, life isn't fair. <laughs> Get over it. Recognition and acceptance. Life is not fair. Is it fair that you have a safe place to sleep tonight when half the world doesn't? No. Is it fair that you have all the food that you could eat and more when half the world doesn't have access to food at all? That's not fair. Is it fair that there are kids growing up in Ethiopia that will only live to be four or five years old and die of malnutrition and you don't? In our culture, we don't. Is that fair? Of course not. Mm. Life isn't fair. So the antidote for that is to accept it, to recognize and accept it where it is instead of trying to fight and rally against it. If you can help other people who are living with these situations that aren't fair, if you can help them, do what you got to do. Help them out. That's what I do in life. But I accept the fact that life is not fair, so I don't expect it to be fair. And that is the erudition and the awareness that lets go of anger. And instead, I focus on gratitude. I'm grateful that I went through what I went through with AS. I've become very educated on self-expression and living as a, an effective human being in the world and understanding my life purpose and my spiritual acumen and all the rest of this uh, wisdom that I pursue. And I would have had none of that without the AS. I'd probably be a fat accountant somewhere, drunk, cheating on my wife. Yeah. If I hadn't gone through the self-discovery that AS led me to. Yeah. So is it fair? No, there's no such thing. Now, does mean we don't act fairly when we can. I'm a fair-minded individual, and I institute fairness where it's uh, appropriate. I'm a fair-minded individual. But I recognize that the world is not fair. And if we want the world to be fair, we're going to be let down time and time again. And that creates anger and resentment. Mm -hmm. So that's the solution to anger. There is a solution. It takes recognition and can take some time to achieve that recognition. But that's the path out of the suffering of anger, out of the hell of the anger. I think, too, that when someone gets to the point of accepting their situation and not and not being so angry that things aren't fair, then they can start to look at some of the positive things in their life. And one thing I really believe in is that, that health is born from health. And I know that during my time really working towards getting my life better from AS, I let go of a lot of the anger by doing what you said, accepting that life isn't always fair, and once I did that, my head was cleared up enough, some of the anger was gone, and then I could look at some of the good things in my life. I could look at some of the, the benefits, some of the pros, and put my energy and focus there. And it was from that shifting of focus from everything is wrong, I'm wrong, the world's not fair, I'm resentful, <laughs> everything sucks, I suck, that happy, <laughs> to, to like, hey, let's, let's, really look at the good things in my life, even if at the time they were very hard to see, like there was some silver lining somewhere and I could find Always. it and learn from it. And it was that shift and time really focusing there that really helped me out. There's always a silver lining to everything. 
In fact, I don't even think in terms of positive or negative anymore. I've gotten beyond that. My training in uh, the Kabbalah talks about how there's just action and consequence. Mm -hmm. Isn't right or wrong, good or bad. It's just action and consequence. If you don't want the consequence of going to prison, don't take somebody's property. It's just action and consequence. So most people aren't going to get to that level of consciousness. I understand. I'm aware of that. But I don't think in terms of negative, every negative thing that happened to me led me to a positive outcome. And that's the duality in the world in which we live revealing itself. We live in the duality of the third dimensional world. We're in the three dimensional reality where there's up and down, left and right, this and that, in and out, male and female, yeah. light and dark. It's duality. So it's not positive or negative. It, it's all meant to be. This is taught in uh, Tantra yoga as well. There's nothing wrong with what's happening. <clears throat> if you do something that your society doesn't approve or appreciate, then you'll pay the consequences of that. So this is not a license for ignorance. Don't go out and rob a bank because you think there's nothing wrong. Because society will disagree with you completely and they'll pay, make you pay the price. So not a license for ignorance. Again, this is for people with a higher level of awareness than most. Most people won't reach this level of awareness. But for us and those who are aware of what I'm talking about, I didn't make this up. I simply learned it from studying others. There is no positive and negative. Everything serves. So then we get to a spiritual awareness of what if everything is sacred? For people who are religious, even a God, whether they're Judaism or Christianity or Islamic or whatever they are, if everything was created by the, the great creator, what isn't sacred? Everything is sacred. That means if everything is sacred, there's nothing that is that shouldn't be. There's nothing that shouldn't be that can't be. Mm -hmm. What is, is, and what isn't can be. So these are deep awarenesses that lead you past the small-mindedness of it isn't fair. It's not fair. Boo-hoo. Okay. And that's what you were on to. That's what I put you on to when you were doing your work and clearing your consciousness. That's what life is for. That's why we're born, is to clear our conscience so that we can be happy, healthy, loving, peaceful, and joyful. And there are people who actually live this way. People who had devastating diseases and overcame them. Boy, doesn't that bring on a lot of joyful awareness? I was, I was just going to say, like, you listed off how people live, like, that have reclaimed their life from AS. And it's that. It's like, they're joyful. They're grateful. <laughs> they're giving back to the world in ways that make them feel good and make others feel good. And the list Absolutely. Goes Love, joy, and peace of mind. Yeah. Health, so, wealth, and happiness. Yeah. And fun. Movement. I love movement. And I remember that that was one reason why I just, I couldn't accept a life of endless pain. It was because I wanted you to. You had to do something about it. Yeah. That's the gift of AS. You've got to do something about this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't let you rest. So therefore, it's the best coach you'll ever have. If you handle it properly, its mission is completed and it falls away by itself as you rebuild and, and begin a new life. And that's what we're doing every day with our groups and our coaching practice. Yeah. So it is possible. I mean, it's more than possible. We have examples of it all over the world. Yeah. And so you just said something that is very profound. And you said that it falls away by itself. And you are willing to share another habit that heals with us today. This is number four. Peter Winslow's, Winslow's Habits That Heal, lesson number four. So you talked about it goes away by itself as you rebuild and refocus. And so your habit number four that I'm going to share in just a moment it talks about a tool for doing that. And I'll read it here in a minute. And then I'd love for you to talk about your experience teaching this and how you've seen it change people's brains through neuroplasticity, how you've seen, seen it change their focus in life, and how it is such a concrete part of the 
rebuilding and refocusing. Does that make sense? I'm all over it. Okay. So Winslow's habit that heals lesson number four, stop talking about pain. Peter says, you can't reconcile the pain of the past by talking to yourself about it. You must lose all interest in past pain and focus completely on what turns you on. It's awesome. That's a new, that's, that's a new tenet for most people to realize, right? Because we're all taught to focus on the pain, focus on what's wrong and try and fight it and get rid of it. Oh, and by the way, there's no cure. Instead, with this, when you don't focus on the pain, it falls away by itself if you do things right. And you don't have to fight with it at all. As you focus on what lights you up and what really turns you on instead. So why is that? So why is it when people change their focus? When they change the focus from focusing on the pain, trying to fix pain, trying to heal their gut, trying to understand the mechanics of the body, why is it when they shift their focus away from that and they start, in your words, doing things right, why does that make such a big difference in the body and in the mind and the brain? Well, first of all, what they're doing is stressful and they're resisting. They're trying to get rid of the pain. They're trying to get out of the disease. They're trying to get rid of it, make it go away, learn why it's there, figure out everything they can learn about it, understand all the science and awareness. And this is all resistance. It's all based on, I'm going to make this go away. And as the celebrated Viennese psychiatrist taught us, Carl Jung from Jungian psychology, he said, what we resist persists. So there's no cure. If you resist it, it persists. There's no way to let it go. So everybody's fighting it and trying to make it go away and try to understand it to figure out how to make it go away. That's all resistance because they're trying to get rid of it. And what we resist persists. And on the other hand, what we focus on expands. So instead of focusing on the illness, focus on love, joy, peace of mind, health, wealth, and happiness. By the way, all these things are called abundance. Abundant health, abundant wealth, abundant happiness, abundant joy, abundant love, abundant peace of mind. Focus on those things and do the practices. And sooner or later, the pain falls away by itself. So we can't focus on our past pain and talk about it to ourselves and expect it to go away. You have to let go of the pain of the past. The past doesn't even exist. If I ask you to go to Walmart right now and pick me up some past, you know, or go to the store and find past on the shelf and bring me the past, you can't really do it, can you? It doesn't no. exist anywhere except in your own imagination. Yeah. It's kept alive by your memory. It doesn't exist now. It's gone. It's let go of. So if you're still focused on your past pain, you're keeping it alive through phantom memories. And that's what you're focused on, and that's what you expand into. What you focus on expands. So when you focus on these other things of an abundant nature, and the abundant nature that animates your very being, it changes your focus, it changes your energy, it changes your frequency, changes your habits and your behaviors and your thoughts and your feelings. And that's when the old stuff falls away and takes its place rightfully in the past where it belongs. This is not easy to explain because we're talking about a state of being. And you can't explain a state of being. Being happy. I can tell you all about how to be happy and it doesn't mean you can go do it. You know, it's like trying to taste honey. If you've never tasted honey and I try to explain to you what it's like to taste honey, that it's golden and it's thick and it's cloying and it's sweet and it's all these wonderful things, it doesn't mean you know how to taste honey. It's a state of being. And you can't speak a state of being. You can't explain a state of being. You can't do a state of being. You can only be happy. Be loving. Be healthy. But most people are focused on the opposite of that because they don't know what it is to be healthy until they've been sick. Which is another teaching from the yogic masters. Yeah. You don't know what health is until you've lost it. Yeah. 
And that's the opportunity that's come to us through this process called ankylosing spondylitis so that we can get back on track and pay attention and focus on what really lights us up. Then you do the practices and it falls away by itself. No amount of trying to force it away and make it go and get rid of it and all the rest. No amount of that has ever worked in the long term. And that's why the medical professionals, very learned and, and very intelligent people, will say, there's no cure here. That doesn't mean there aren't alternatives. They just don't study the alternatives. And you said something that I think that a lot of listeners probably haven't made the connection with yet. And it's that focusing on the problems, focusing on, again, like I'll relate this to my story. The day after I was diagnosed with AS, I got on the internet. And I remember my mom called me and she was like, she was worried about me. And she said, Sky, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm okay. I'm going to get on the internet and I'm going to, I'm going to figure this thing out. And I got on the internet and story after story after story was horrifying. Oh yeah. And I recognize clearly now that to your point, Peter, focusing there was stressful. I was doing everything I could to learn about the disease, to learn about, the different medications and people's reactions. And, and I was really doing my best with what I had to work with at the time. And I was completely focused in a place that just created more and more stress and more victimization and more hopelessness and more just shaking my head and being like, you know, oh my God, like this is going to be my life. And that was not a healthy place to have my head. Again, it was like, it's what we do. It, there's a lot of people with AS that are doing that. Maybe that's how they've discovered this podcast. And I just want everyone to recognize that that's a stressful place to be looking. And then the second part of that, Peter, you're talking about kind of what healthy mindsets are. And I think that people just recognizing that a focus there, not only does it not feel good, it's not really true health. It's problem solving. It's a focus on pain instead of what you taught me of focus on abundance, focus on health. And I remember you said something really good one day and you're like, Sky, most of your body is working just fine. And you were like, you can see, you can taste, you can walk barely, <laughs> but you can <laughs> and be aware of that. Like acknowledge that most of your body is working well. And I was so engulfed in pain and just wanting the pain to be gone. And um, it was a really healthy mindset refocus to have you encourage me to stop talking about the pain, right? Lesson number four here. And acknowledge that a lot of my body is working well. So let's, let's put some focus on being grateful that I can see and taste. And that was kind of like the foundation of some really important changes for me. Yeah, and you can eat, and you can digest and assimilate those nutrients, and you can operate your brain, and your thyroid function is happening. I mean, all these things are happening properly. 99%, perhaps, at least 90% of what's going on in your body is working just fine. Let's yeah. focus on that. Yeah. So, of course, people are focused on the pain because it hurts. It hurts bad. It mm -hmm. hurts a lot, and this creates fear of flares and other you know, issues that people have with what they're going through. So we've got remedies for that. We've got, you know, I've got uh, meditations that completely stop pain in minutes and put your mind at ease and at rest and let go of all the stress. And it's a temporary stopgap like a drug. It'll get you out of the pain right away for 24 hours or so, and then you do it again. The difference between this and a drug is that you're conditioning your subconscious mind for success when you keep doing these practices daily. You meditate daily with my guided imagery programs or you exercise daily physically to change the wiring in your brain, which is where the pain lives. The pain is in your brain. They're looking for it in your spine and in your genetics. It's in the brain. That's the nervous system headquarters that processes pain. And that's why uh, pain medications work is because they break this, that pathway between the afflicted area in the body and the brain itself and the nervous system flow of energy flow of the p factor which stands for pain 
which lets the brain know that you know you bumped your knee and you feel it and you know where you bumped your body it was your knee and your brain registers that we can stop that process with drugs so that the brain can not recognize what's going on and then you don't feel any pain then when it wears off you're back to where you started you can do the same thing naturally. So of course people are interested in letting go of pain because it hurts and it hurts bad. But I'm interested in letting it go forever. Not just fighting with it and being a warrior for the rest of your life like I tried to do for 10 years and then realized there's no healing here. Because what are we focused on? What we resist. And as we've learned what we resist persists. Emotionally, mentally, and deeper, of a deeper awareness. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to become a spiritual master or a you know, philosopher of one stripe or another in order to do this. You simply have to feel good. And I teach people how to feel good. And that's when the pain falls away. The emotional pain falls away. The mental pain and stress go away. And the physical body follows the mind. And these things fall away by themselves. And people are like, gosh, I just feel great and I don't know why. I've been coaching with you for two weeks or three weeks and the pain is gone and I don't know why. So now they start going to look for the pain again. Where's the pain? Let's analyze it. Let's figure out what happened. Where did it go? <laughs> you don't have to do any of that. Mm -hmm. Change your focus and follow the exercises. Yeah. Yeah. Following the exercises is of extreme importance. And I've, I've seen it too where people, the pain leaves. And they're like, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't right. get it. And so they start looking for it or they start doubting it or they start. I think some people might even miss it a little bit because it was so much of who they were in life. And so they start looking for it. And it's a really good example when it does come back of, of the, the mind body connection that we talk about. It's very I had one guy in a class say that, uh, you know, his pain went away in a couple of weeks and he's like, what do I do now? What do I do with the boredom? I'm bored. Because <laughs> he didn't have pain to fight with anymore. He's bored. <laughs> so I talked to him about what lights him up. I said, what would you do if you, you know, if you didn't need money and you could do whatever you love to do? What would you do? And he said, I'd be in a rock band. I said, you play a musical instrument? He said, I play guitar. I said, go play more guitar. Instead of fighting with the pain, do what lights you up. Focus on that. I found it very, very interesting and pretty funny when he said okay now the pain's gone and i'm bored what do i do <laughs> yeah right well it kind of makes sense because it's so much of his focus every day it's like it's a challenge to overcome and our brains like to be thinking about stuff our brains like to be overcoming challenges and again if that big one is just all of a sudden gone it's what like i feel sorry for him what a, what a problem to have <laughs> his pain went away <laughs> so i told him what my mother told me only boring people get bored. Yeah. So now go pick up a new habit. Yeah. Start playing your guitar. Yeah, I hope he's playing music. I've been speaking with two people um, that play music as well. And it, it's fun that um, I like music. I love musicians. And um, oh, yeah. It's pretty neat. I've noticed that they get back to the music pretty quickly as soon as they can. And it's I. It's passion. It's passion. And I think that their music improves. I think that they can, I mean, everything in life can improve when we have the energy and the focus that doesn't have to go towards trying to figure out AS and deal with the endless chronic pain, which is super exhausting and tiring. Stressful. Stressful. And the stress creates the inflammation. Yeah. And the inflammation causes pain and the pain doesn't feel good. And your job is to feel good. Now let's get you there. So let's, so let's talk about, for our last 10 minutes here, let's jump back and along the theme of, of feeling good, doing our best, learning how to feel good. Let's talk about the people who are in a lot of pain right now who have the it's not fair mentality. They are on a super limited diet and they're super healthy in all these ways. Maybe they're going to yoga. Maybe they're, they're vegan. Maybe they're meditating every day. And they see their friends who are partying, dancing, living this, this free spirit life that the people with AS would love to be doing. 
movement, just like playing, it can be hard to not feel that the life is really unfair in those situations. And I remember being really angry. And so let's talk about that for a minute of, of like some, some ways that people that are in that state can feel good and not feel that life is just unfair and a burden. Any ideas? So that's part of the practices that we teach, how to do that. Because, yeah, these people are in a spot, man. I was one of them. You were one of them. We know what it's like to be denied a quality of life, to have this incessant mystery illness that nobody can figure out. And, you know, we're trying to analyze it for the best of our abilities to figure it out and make it go away. You know, that's the hope. If I figure it out, then I'll discover how to make it go away. Yeah. Well, I've already figured it out. It's unresolved emotional issues that are creating the stress in the subconscious mind that come out in the body as negative immune response and inflammation. Nothing more to figure out. Stop trying to figure it out beyond that. This is the saving grace of the whole situation. That's why the pain goes away so quickly and stays away so readily. It's because you don't have anything more to figure out. Human beings make everything so complicated. Have you noticed? <laughs> Yeah. The more complicated something is, the more valuable we think it is. So jet propulsion is much more complicated than uh, drafting a regular prop aircraft. So jets cost a lot more, and so they're more valuable. They're, they're more technologically advanced, so it's automatically more valuable. So we think that the more complicated the re results are, the more it's worth. So we want to make this very, very complex and come to a resolution with it and none of that none of that is necessary none of that has to happen you don't have to analyze it anymore in fact analysis will create paralysis it's called analysis paralysis mm -hmm. you've heard that phrase i have there's no cure there so you said you wanted to talk to the people who are feeling that this isn't fair and yeah i mean because i was i was stuck there for years and um I know that that can require more more dialogue and and some fine tuned approaches for the individual um, because they're complicating it. So you have to talk them out of it. Hmm. That's what I spend half my time doing is talking people out of their mindsets. And then I found very effective ways to do that. Instead of trying to talk them out of something, I talk them into what lights them up. Would you like to feel good? Focus on this gratitude. Oh yeah, I've heard that before. And I write down five things every morning I'm grateful for. Yeah, but do you feel it? Mm -hmm. It's the feeling that counts, not the intellectual processing. And that's one of the problems that we're facing with this situation today as well, is that we've trained our citizenry and the people in our communities to focus completely on being smart, getting into, going to school, getting degrees, getting educated, being smart. Forget what you're feeling. You know, I, I don't care. I could care less if you're feeling good or feeling happy. Go get smart. Focus on your intelligence. We've got kids now training on the computer at two years old instead of being kids, you know, and playing. Because we want them to be smart. It's intelligence that counts to us. That's all that matters in the end. How intelligent are you? It's a balance, Skylar. We've got to be balanced. And what's more important isn't just how, you, how smart you are. It's how you feel. So when you're feeling the pain of AS, are you worried about how smart you are? Some people are. They create the stress in their mind, like, I'm not smart enough to figure this out. So then they self-abnegate again. They bust themselves and bust their chops down and feel bad about who they are because they're not smart enough to figure it out. Nobody can figure this out. The brightest minds in medicine are working on it. They still haven't done it. It isn't intellectual in approach. It's how do you feel that counts in life. The Eastern philosophers are all over this. We in the West think intelligence above all, but it's a balance. We're certainly not anti-intelligence here. Some people have told me that I'm fairly intelligent. We're not against intelligence. It's just, this isn't a matter of being intelligent. This is a matter of how are you feeling? And if you're focused on what feels bad, you're gonna keep expanding what feels bad. So feel gratitude. Cool. That's really all you got to do. Yeah. To get started. Cool.
Be That's grateful great. that you found us. There are people in the world who have overcome AS and don't feel pain at all anymore. <laughs> We're living proof of this. We're happy. Yeah. We're healthy. <laughs> We're loving life again. Be grateful yeah. that you found this. Yeah. Do the practices. Let go of that past pain. It falls away by itself. You know, and, and you just brought up the letting go of past pain, and that's, that's a really accurate thing for people to do, to answer my own question of like, what do we do when we're in that, those states of where we just feel like everything is unfair? Part of it is not talking about it, right? I mean, it's, you told me something earlier on, and you're like, Sky, only talk with people that can really help you. Don't talk about your problems to anybody you cannot help. Mm -hmm. It just is a focus on what makes you weak. It repels them, reminds them of their weaknesses, and then they get afraid or they don't have a high opinion of you anymore or they feel something adverse in their bodies. And if they can't help you, what's the result? Talk to people who can help. Yeah. Don't talk to anyone about your pain if they cannot help you. Mm -hmm. that's, what I, that's what I said to you. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I see where the more we talk about things with, neg like, the more I would talk about AS with people that couldn't actually help me, I'm just reinforcing into my mind and body the constancy of pain, the constancy of fear, the, the constant dialogue of, I have AS, I have AS, I have AS. And with my brain staying there, I couldn't have done what I did. It had to shift at least to, I'm someone who, who feels a little bit of hope <laughs> instead of just, I'm in pain, life isn't fair, I have AS. That's what uh, Eckhart Tolle calls identification with form. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I have AS, I have AS, I'm identified as this is who I am. You know, with this form called AS, I'm identified with it. And okay, so then you get to be right. As you believe, so you receive. If you think you can, you can. If you think you cannot, you cannot. Either way, you're right. Remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So focus on the opposite virtues is what I teach. You have to learn how to do this stuff, by the way. Yeah. I had to learn. It took me years to learn this. But I can teach it to people in eight hours. All the salient points that build from one to the next and lead you to where you want to be. But it takes some time process this it's a it's a process yeah what else are you going to do for the next two years right i think uh, this work is the most important work that people with chronic disease and chronic pain can be doing i absolutely I wholly agree this is the most important thing in their life that's why it's so immediate that's why it's so painful it's saying look stop focusing on all these other things that aren't as important same thing's true with cancer by the way if, when people get a cancer diagnosis they got to stop everything and live from this perspective of how do I defeat cancer? Mm -hmm. If you have to quit your job, if you have to fire your battle ax girlfriend, <laughs> you have to sell your house, you've got to do what you've got to do to put that first. It's gotta be a priority in your life. That's what these diseases do, is make us change our perspective. And yeah. if you change it for the positive, those are the people who overcome cancer. They're the ones who have hope. And, Hope springs eternal and they feel okay with what is. They're not resisting what is. And they go through the treatment, they do the practices, and they recover. Mm -hmm. That's what AS is. It's the most important work I ever did in my life. It led me to an entire way of life that I can't complain about in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. I love what I do and I do what I love. I feel good. I'm strong. I'm healthy. I'm 61 years old and going well. I got most of this from AS, from that path I had to take because I had to do something with it. The most important work I've ever done. So you're absolutely right, Sky. I'd agree with you 100%. This is the most important work that people can do. And so people say, well, I'm going to do it in my spare time. You know, I want, to, I want you to help me, but uh, I've got other things that are more important. You know, I've got to go to my kid's baseball game. And I understand that. You've got to do what you've got to do. But if it isn't important to you, you're probably not going to get the results that you want in life. What you make important lead to the results that you get. So go to your kid's ball game, but make this a priority too. Yeah. 
And people will not regret it. I know that. I haven't had anybody say, I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> yeah, me neither. I've never talked to anyone and they were like, well, that was a waste of time or, you know, none of that. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. All right, Peter, when is your next, if you have the date, do you know when your next group class is starting? It's the second Wednesday in September. The second Wednesday in September. Okay, cool. Good. Yeah. I, I want people to know that. I want people to know that, that you are accessible and that your class is is an invitation for people to step in and start connecting with you and with others who are on the same path and it's so fun because technology allows us to connect all over the world and it's so yeah. and it's so unique and people people become friends we might not see each other a lot other than on the zoom call but but it's a meaningful place to be and it's really important a supportive community of like-minded individuals who are all paying attention and, and giving back to each other. Yeah, uh, so that program that you talked about is the AS Recovery Challenge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you can look it up on asrecoverychallenge.com and see what it is, what we're doing, and what the results are for relief, remission, and recovery from AS. Great, Peter. Well, thank you. Again, I love having you on the show, man. You're your wisdom around AS and your passion to help lift people like myself out of the suffering that we've been in is um, really special. And you, you said something earlier today. You're like, people find me kind of smart. And I'm like, hell yeah, the dude's smart. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> glad I found you. <laughs> and I'm glad <laughs> people are continuing to find you and this work and that their lives are changing. So. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a mentor of mine and a good friend. And um, we will we'll have you back here again two weeks from now. All right. Well, I've really enjoyed our time together, Skyler. There's nothing I'd rather do than lead people out of darkness and into light. So thank you for providing this platform in which to do so. Yeah. Really appreciate it. And I appreciate you, my friend. Good work. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. And I remember the first video I ever saw of you on YouTube and how far I've come since then. And it's, it's an honor to be here. And, and I love it. I'm having fun. I'm, I've really found a passion in life through this work. I found a calling. It's, it's supporting me. I'm, I'm loving it. That's good karma, my friend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is good karma. Cool. Well, we'll see you soon. Thank you. All right, then. So yeah. Okay. A fun show, no doubt. A couple of things. We talk about resent in transitioning from a place of resent to a place of gratitude. That is a big transition. That is a very big shift for a lot of people to make. So I want you to understand that it doesn't have to happen overnight. And most likely it, it won't. But you have the option to work in that direction. You can choose to stay angry. You can choose to ignore the good things in your life. You can choose to ignore that people care about you and that your body is working perfectly most of the time and in many, many ways. Or we can choose to be angry. We can choose to not let that anger go and continuously find things to be angry about. And it's pretty obvious what what your life will look like in a few years if you're able to let anger go, especially when you continue to, to listen to this podcast and, and practice what we're talking about. And that's what I want for you. I want you to begin feeling better. Acceptance that life simply isn't fair is one of the first steps to getting beyond the anger of that fact. And another very, very good friend of mine, a published author, a high-end executive success coach, he told me something one time, and he said that, Sky, possibilities are on the other side of acceptance. And how that can break down in this situation is, if I believe that my life isn't fair, that I'm angry, that it's not fair that I have AS, if I can never come to just accept that life isn't fair and that this is my life right now, I continuously live in this anger. I continuously live 
in this state of stress. I'd like you guys to think of stress as, as a heightened state. Excuse me, I'd like you to think of anger as a heightened state of stress. It's not good for the body. But when I can accept that life isn't fair, and I can accept that this is my life right now, whether I like it or not, all of a sudden I have a little bit more mental space to create positive outcomes, to look for new possibilities. Because all of a sudden when I accept that this is the way life is, that stress kind of goes away. And then I'm like, okay, I feel a little bit better now. What can I do for myself that's healthy? What can I do to feel good? Who can I learn from? Who can I do a favor for? What can I do to begin feeling better now? But when we do not, when we're not accepting of what's happening, when we're just pissed off all the time, we just don't have the energy to go there. So as you listen to this podcast and beyond, and as you apply these practices in your life, I want you to remember that possibilities are on the other side of acceptance. And if you accept the truth that this podcast is and everything we talk about in this episode, all of a sudden more possibilities exist for you. When you accept that your life is what it is and that there are also good things in your life, all of a sudden, based on those good things, there are more opportunities available to you. And all of this has to do with where electricity is moving in the brain. We can break this down and be more and more scientific about it. And there might be time to do that in the future. But right now, I just want everyone to have the, the tools. Because whether or not you understand how the science works, just know that it works. <laughs> just know that your physiology, your biochemistry, the, the neurological hardwiring of your brain, all of that changes as you practice what we're talking about. Any questions, please reach out to me. I want to thank the people that are reaching out with good questions. I love them and I'm happy that you're reaching out. I would absolutely ask that people share this podcast with someone that they know, someone that they love, someone that they know can benefit from what we're talking about, even if they don't have ankylosing spondylitis. Because what we discuss here applies across the board to just people living good lives, improved lives no matter what disease they have. You can contact me personally at skydenton.com and you can also find me on Facebook at Ankylosing Spondylitis Reduce Your Pain and YouTube, Ankylosing Spondylitis Reduce Your Pain as well. And I am continuously making content and videos. I'm having a lot of fun with everyone that I'm speaking with one-on-one. -on -one. And I want to encourage everyone to, to reach out when the time is right for you. There are good people here that care about you and have the skill set to help you let go of, of suffering and of pain and to live a better life. With that, I look forward to connecting with you again soon. It is possible to feel good again, and I'm absolutely happy to tell you that. So for now, sit on that, and we will talk again soon.